The views and opinions expressed on From the Mouths of Madness are that of the panel and not of the Geeks Under the Influence Network or their sponsors. Amazon.com and TeePublic.com. Listeners, beware. Coming straight from the mouths of madness, I am one of the hosts, Lowdown. With me, as always, is... F you honor. What's up, bitches? Yeah, bitches. We uh, hope you live long, bitches. <laughs> yeah, by like some weird, creepy insect thing. And the fuck was that? They never explain... That's one thing that pisses me off, is they, ne- they don't they never explain that shit. They don't have to. It's, it's this weird fucking... It's as we're about to say, but it's Del Toro. Mm, True. So, yeah, tonight on the Chopping Block, we're going to talk about 1993's little independent Mexican horror film, Kronos. Yep. And uh, it's actually a horror drama. It definitely blends the two genres. I'll give it that. Oh, yeah. Horror and drama. And it is also the directorial debut of Guillermo del Toro. Yeah. I think he did, like, two shorts before this. Yeah. And then someone funded him enough for a full-length fucking movie. And by the way, we're seeing, like, really well funded <laughs> debut films oh yeah like what the fuck how many how many how many first films have you seen with somebody that are like fucking shiny and glistening and they got actual money behind them you well know? i mean i guess it just proves a lot with the short films it kind of goes from there it's just it's what happens though like you know sometimes you get short films and they fucking just impress the fuck out people are like all right i'll Give you millions of dollars to start doing your first movie. I trust you, dude. I didn't see how much this movie costs to make, but it definitely is a. It definitely comes off as an expensive. Well, plus he, he wrote film. it. I mean, and that that you know he has the entire vision. And sometimes producers are willing to trust you a lot more when you're not just taking someone's script and doing your interpretation of it. You already have a complete vision. You have your script. You're directing your script, and that, Fair. and that sometimes is where people go, okay. Let's see how you do, you know? Yep, well, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, that that, that actually makes a lot of sense. And that's honestly what happened with Tarantino is literally Tarantino, you know, dogs, yeah. his first couple of scripts, people were buying them, and he was like, uh-uh, I want to direct my script, and that's Reservoir Dogs. Mm-hmm. So. And look, and, oh, so good, <laughs> so good. This one's a little limited on actual cast in general because you don't really have a very wide cast. That probably caught, cut costs there, oh, yeah. too. But the big, uh, big, biggest name, we'll get, we'll go ahead and talk about him. We got Ron Perlman, very young, Ron, like, dude, that haircut was not flattering. Oh, man. He literally looked like a fucking gorilla. It's, it's right in the period, and I'm going to throw this movie out there, if anybody's seen it, it's the Sleepwalker period where he looks like a fucking cat. <laughs> he still has that, that cat looking face. Way the fuck before Sons of Anarchy. Mm-hmm. So, what was the haircut, dude? I think once he got like the the military cut, it helps a lot. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's just that when he lets it get curly, it just does not work for it. It does dude. not. But yeah, I mean, so obviously we just said Sons of Anarchy. That's literally the biggest thing he's known for right now. He's done blockbusters, but Sons of Anarchy is his like. He mecca. does have a tendency though of popping up in a lot of like directors' kind of early films. Because he was in um, the guy that directed Alien Resurrection, um, one of his early movies. That's how Ron Perlman ended up in Alien Resurrection. Mm-hmm. You know, um, he was in Goddamn Drive. You know, like yeah. so he seems to just pop up and he gives like, hey, if you got a spot for me, I- I'm supporting your shit. Yeah, you know. And I mean, I mean, then like you said, we obviously the s- the second thing you probably know him from that's just huge is Hellboy. He is Hellboy. Yep. <laughs> like. I remember in uh, he was in GalaxyCon in Richmond, Virginia, uh, the first GalaxyCon. No, it wasn't GalaxyCon then. It was uh, uh, it was Wizard World. World. Yeah, and he was like, "I'm waiting for Del Toro to call me about finishing this thing out, Hellboy Three, but I'm I'm getting fucking old. Like, yeah, need to do it now. <laughs> Get too over this shit." And he's being honest. He's fucking old. Yeah, you know. But uh, obviously, he was like he was in Blade Two. I think that's the first thing I actually saw him in. Where like when I saw him in Hellboy, I'm like, "Oh, okay, I know who he is." Yeah. I think I really saw him. I remembered him from Alien Resurrection in Blade Two, but like Blade Two was kind of like that's the that's the like the role one, yeah. I remember really seeing him in. And pretty much from Alien Resurrection forward, he's pretty much the same person. He, yeah, he, he's just the same character. It's how much he gets to use like curse words. 
in he, his role. He's, he always plays a character of that kind of gives two shits. Exactly. Like, he Hellboy. really just... <laughs> like, he, yeah. Clay? Yeah. Fucking Sons of Anarchy? Pacific Rim? He doesn't give a fuck at Pacific Rim. Yeah, he just gives two <laughs> shits. Gives two sh- in this one, all he cares about is his inheritance. He's kind of the Johnny Depp uh, to Del Toro's Tim Burton, like fair, yeah, he yeah. seems to pop up in most of Del Toro's movies. Yeah, for those who don't know, Del Toro has something to do with Blade too. Just saying. Uh, yep, and Pacific Rim, <laughs> and Pacific Rim. Yeah. So, just if you didn't know, that's why we're saying that. <laughs> but um, the other one being uh, Federico Lupi, Lupi. I don't know how to pronounce. I'm sorry, <laughs> pretty sure it's Lupi. Yeah, L- or Lupi. Or, uh, but he was actually in two other Del Toro films as well. He was in Pan's Labyrinth, and he was in The Devil's Backbone. Um, we will be talking about those movies in a future time period because all Del Toro's movies, especially his earlier work, definitely needs to be talked about. Yeah. Now, the one thing I will say about this compared to some of his later movies is this movie is a lot seems like a lot more body horror than like imaginative um, like creatures and ghosts, There's, creatures yeah, and ghosts, yeah. creatures and ghosts. Where that's kind of the like stamp of Del Toro in most of his movies. This is again his first movie, so it's a lot of practical like effects, but like realistic practical for effects. Agreed, agreed. Yeah. Um, that caught me off guard because I, I I was expecting some well, weird this fucking is your, creature. This is your first time. This is my first it. time watching it. Yeah. And I was expecting. All right, when do we get the like weird ass? You know, not saying dude with eyeballs in his hands, but something of that sort. <laughs> and no, it's very more body, just like you it's kind of dry too. It's like. Here's the story, and uh, as we go along, we do get a creature. It's just early t- Del Toro creature. Yeah, and that's right? what I was going to say, know? is that the amulet or whatever it is that, you know, causes everything, that's where you get kind of that Del Toro feel. Yeah, you really, once you see inside it, there is something in there. Yeah. But you never really get a clear view, right? Yeah. And the, the other thing I'd say is, um, is there's a little girl in this, Del Toro always he has the thing sometimes where he likes to have that that child relationship and yeah. relationship thing yeah yeah and, but for this it works awesome so basically uh, it, you start off in 1536 there's an <laughs> alchemist who creates a device that gives eternal life uh, the m- m- flash forward to 1937 he is still alive but a building collapses uh, shrapnel pierces his heart which actually kills that will kill him yeah that's the only way you technically you you can die as if the heart is pierced and he looks weird as shit like white he has skin. really moon waxy yeah. skin but that's because he's it, he hasn't grown into his new skin yet because when they go to his apartment they find a body strung up bled out like a deer <laughs> in like basin so yeah the negative side to the thing he created is you it, you crave blood now flash forward to i'm assuming this took place in present day 93 you've got the character that uh federico played he was an antique dealer. Yeah. You know, his kids, his, so his kids, his son died, his son and, and his stepdaughter died in a car accident, so they have their grandkid, uh, him, and, him and his wife, and they run an antique store, and there's another older gentleman who has been scouring the world for the statue. God damn. That the fucking alchemist owned. Yeah. That's where he hid It was the, like an angel yeah. type one. And to that's where point, he hid the fucking you, you, the uh, amulet. amulet. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you realize this because literally you go into this dude's place, and it's this long ass room. Why would you keep them? But with just hanging angels, ever like in plastic bags. And these aren't small people. These yeah. this thing's got to be at least four and a half feet tall. I guess it's just kind of to check it off, like you know, like, like what the fuck? Just to burn it. Like what are you keeping it for? It 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 wasn't what you wanted. So he kept the amulet. In the base of the statue, and after someone comes and shows interest, Ron Perlman, who's his nephew, was like, no, no, it was some dude who came and looked at it, was scoping it out, contacted Ron Perlman, and let him know, like, hey, it's here. Yeah. He went and talked to his uncle, was like, okay, I'm going out to get it. Well, in the time period between that, he, the uh, antique dealer, gets it and starts, why is he, well, because it was wrapped in there fucking paper. bugs. Remember, like, there's a hole and bugs start going out. So he's like, all these bugs that's are coming right. out of it. So that's, that's right. where he's investigating it and discovers the amulet. The in amulet. There. Yeah, that's right. No, there was like roaches and just... all over the fucking place. <laughs> Big fucking ones, yeah, too, man. Fucking terrible. <laughs> well, Mexico probably Mexican. Yeah, the same cockroaches. Yeah, it's ugh. yeah. They it's were they were fucking huge. Ugh. Anyway, so he turns it. It's got like a little dial. He winds it up and it starts to 
run and then all of a sudden legs come out <laughs> of the side and then grab his hand. I like I like that too because they pop out and he's just kind of palming it. And he's like, oh okay, all right, that's cool. And then they pop out. And he's like, that's weird. And then it almost like a spider's like comes Rips. out even yeah. more and then yeah. ran right into his fucking hand. He's like looking at his granddaughter while it's happening. He doesn't even realize they lift it up like they're getting ready to do something and funk. And then he, there's a stinger that comes out and goes right into your wrist and also punctures in the palm too. Yeah. Like it's it like, it's almost like it injects like a venom. Yeah. And so really this dude's just like a innocent bystander. It, 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 it happened and it wasn't like he was asking for it, which kind of sucks. Like, that's why you, it's a drama. You feel for the main character so much because he, he didn't, didn't ask it. for it. Yeah, he didn't need it, you know. He, he wasn't, like, trying to live forever. He was yeah. just like, oh, I found this thing? Cool. Oh, fuck me. <laughs> Here we go. Damn it. You know, it, it wasn't like some greedy motherfucker who wanted to live forever like the uncle The uncle wants that to. wants it, yeah. You know, he just found something, you know. It's, a, it's, a, it's like a classic tale of, oh, wrong place, wrong time, wrong thing in my fucking hand. Yeah, so he starts... Know? Feeling this urge for it, like I mean, he's well, his up hand starts night. itching, and he's yeah. like, he knows, like, like something was telling him to like fucking put that back on his hand. Yeah. And then when he does, it's just like fuck. It's like almost looks like he's having an orgasm. Yeah, well, like, it, it, it's almost <laughs> like yeah, it's like this, and you start to see that he starts embracing this thing, injecting him over and over again. Well, it makes it's making him younger. Yeah, because he's, he's getting shaved, a sex drive back. He shaves his mustache off. He has the typical older man like older mustache white and he's like fuck this shaves it off and like his wife's like oh you're looking younger he's like yeah fuck those wrinkles man. are going away yep sex drives back but they go to a new year's party and <laughs> oh man he realizes that he's got a lust for blood yeah <laughs> so again <laughs> well, we we threw in there where ron perlman buys the angel at the antique store oh going, yeah yeah like all right well this this could be it and realizes this is was it but the thing that's supposed to be there is missing they pull uh him and are like where the fuck is it well you first know? they trash his whole shop yeah because they're like oh no this was it where the fuck is it motherfucker did you separate and try to sell it they're like you're selling us two different pieces yeah you know they don't because they think they don't even know if he knows what it is and then when he comes in and sees his shop's completely wrecked he's like oh but yeah then they well, no. So he he goes to the bathroom because the guy gets a nosebleed at the New Year's party. This is where this is where this the movie gets kind of crazy. Cause, yeah. Because up to that point, you know, this guy's injecting himself over and over again. You're like, okay. And he's sitting at the table. It's this big gala, and one of the other tables, this guy has a nosebleed, and immediately he's like, he centers in. He's like, oh shit, and he is like, like that looks sexy. Yeah. And, <laughs> and he literally gets up from the table. And he's like, I need to get another drink. Yeah. And. Follows the guy into the bathroom. The guy has, he's like, oh, fucking summertime, nose bleeds. Always happens yeah. to me. So it's like, you know, and then like, there's this giant puddle of blood on the fucking uh, uh, basin <laughs> in front of the sink. And he's getting ready to like, just dig into it. He's and, like playing with it. He's like yeah. his finger. He's like moving around. Just like, ooh, to do. What and should I do with who this? Who the fuck walks out of a bathroom stall like that, bro? This dude walks out of the bathroom stall with the pants still around his like thighs. He's pulling them up as he's walking around. Well, the same kind of person that would see blood and use his... Hand Spare hand and just wash, wash it, it off, off the fucking sink. I was like, dude, get some Ew. paper towels, a t like anything. He's just like, uh, somebody's bleeding it's all like, over this fucking like, sink. Hold on, this is '93. AIDS are out. Like, don't touch something, man. Blood, man. Yeah, a you're like, walking out with your fucking pants down by your fucking leg, you know, dude, your feet. It was so gross. Two, you walk and then, but he missed a spot. There's got, and this is where I was like, okay, this is interesting. Because there's a still a puddle of blood from the nosebleed guy on the floor. The floor, yeah. Guy, weird guy that cleans up the fucking sink walks out, and then our dude's like, "Okay, that's free. That's free drink, right?" Like, yummy, yummy, yummy. And he, holy shit, lays on the fucking bathroom floor and just starts licking Lapping it, it up. up, dude, like a fucking cat in a milk bowl, God, dude. He's just dude, going to town. Weird. On like, that's in a bathroom floor. <laughs> it's blood, and it's on a bathroom floor. <laughs> like, fuck that noise. <laughs> Uh, but in comes uh uh so Ron Perlman's character is Angel. Yeah. In comes Angel. We well, get introduced to his feet because as this our dude's fucking licking the blood, you just stomp. see <laughs> you see somebody walk in and you're like, okay, how's he gonna explain this? Like, oh, I dropped a contact in this blood. That's what you're thinking, yeah. and then like, but yeah, you see the feet, and next thing you know, the foot fucking kicks the shit out of him, and you're like, oh, it's fucking Angel. Like, mm -hmm. goddamn it. So this is New Year's, by the way. So this movie starts out at Christmas. 
Now it's moved into New Year's at this point, That's right. right? When I said summertime, I guess it was just the heat is what the guy was talking about. Yeah, they get the it's Mexico. Bleed. It's not going to get that fucking cold, I don't yeah. feel like. I don't know. Never been there. I'm assuming it's close to the equator, so it doesn't really get cold <laughs> for Christmas. Um, so, yeah, because it opens up with a uh, an image of a uh, Feliz Navidad in a puddle. That's right. Yeah. Um, so, our dude man wakes up in the car with Angel. Angel's drinking. Dude's on the radio. He's like, Happy New Year, blah, blah. He's chugging away. Dude wakes up. He, like, forces dude this booze down his throat. And... It's just, this is like a bullshit exchange, but he's basically like, where the fuck is it? He starts beating his ass, gets him out of the car, kicks the shit out of him, ends up putting him back in the car, which yeah. is weird, and then... <laughs> well, because he... Cause, he, he, he thought he beat him to death. He thought he beat him to death. Well, he also realizes that he's not going to give the information. Yeah. He, he's just like... He, the, the dude's like asking him, like, you don't even know what it does, do you? And he's like, I don't care. My uncle said I'm supposed to get fined for him. That's my only concern. Yeah. And then... Because he wants his inheritance. Because he wants to make Uncle happy. Yeah. So he can finally... But he also doesn't really want to find it for him. Because I mean, you know he doesn't want his uncle to live forever. Because his uncle's a fucking dick. He fucking dick. hates his uncle. His yeah. uncle's a fucking dick. Yeah. I hate he, him he too. He has a beating stick and shit. Yeah, what the fuck? I can be a grown-ass man getting beat. Like, fuck that, dude. I mean, cash money. I mean, that's... that's about... Cash rules everything around me. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be with your stick because I'm going to get your fucking dough, man. Yeah, like... yeah, yeah. So, um, he ends up... Angel ends up pushing the car over a cliff, and that was a. There was a really cool shot at the bottom of the cliff when the car explodes, and you see our our dude man's head out like he's dead. His neck is like the wrong position. Yeah. It's he's it's just really really cool shot. Um, and then you kind of get see uh, this is a cool part. So you get him being done, you know, all done up and gussied up, and the dude because they're, yeah they're supposed to. I, it looks like he's getting set up by a mortician to, yeah. for a, an open casket funeral. So he's already done a lot of the sewing up, you know, getting mm-hmm. getting the prep work done to make him look and he's like, presentable. He's dancing. He's like into that shit. He's yeah. like, it's art. Because the guy's like, you man, talking about really Mexican Wolverine? Yeah, Mexican Wolverine. Because <laughs> the dude straight had the Wolverine yeah, cybers yeah, and the yeah, fucking white beater. I was like, that's Mexican Wolverine, Wolverine. God damn it. And like the dude was like, man, you really do good work. He's like, yeah, it's, it's an art farm. And he's just like fucking dancing and loving he's it. Proud he's of like, that shit. And he's like, yeah, too bad they decided to cremate him. And he's like, why did no one tell me this? Why? I mean, because <laughs> like, dude, so it looks like he had spent already hours like yeah. sewing up. He already he so got pissed. to the point where he did the mouth, sewed the mouth shut. So he'd already gotten, taken everything. He was just fin- doing the final touches. And the guy's like, you know, the guy's supposed to get cremated, man. You don't have to do this shit. Mm-hmm. So meanwhile... Well, you're seeing this, and they're getting, they're putting him in the coffin and getting ready to send him into the into the fucking incinerator. You see, Ron, uh, Angel and his uncle having a conversation where this is where the stick comes out. He's broken his Angel's nose again. It looks like because Angel already had a scar, and he's like, "Did you get the heart?" Yeah. No, I, the fuck, you never told me about that. Like Angel's getting beat for no reason. Like he didn't say anything about the heart <laughs> ever. So, yeah, Angel's getting his ass handed to him. So. Angel shows up, but it, before that, you he like the the coroner is d- distracted by oh the gas. It was the gas. That's right. He had to go fix. He it. had to go fix the gas. And did you notice like when he went down there and reset everything, he smelled gas and he wrapped a rag around the pipe. Yeah, not I'm not like, the safest thing. Oh, buddy. Anyway, he goes back up. It lights off. Meanwhile, he didn't notice that the the door to the lid to the coffin was open. Oh, I think he had left it open. I, I, no, I can't it remember. No, it was closed. It was closed? It was closed. Man, this dude sucks at his job. So, like, it's like wide. It's it's open, but he's on the side where you wouldn't see the inside of yeah, it. Yeah, but it was closed when he went down there. Because I remember that. Because you couldn't see, like, from the angle they shot it, you couldn't see, like, really the whole front of the incinerator uh, when he got back. But when, when he left, you could. Which means that the door was open. It was blocking the whole right side of the screen. Yeah. And he so he closed it, and meanwhile, before it closes, you look in and see that the fucking body's gone. And he puts it in, and then turns it up. It's burning away. Ron Perman walks in. An angel <laughs> walks in. So the funny thing about Tito, that's his name, Tito the Corner. There is a standalone sequel called We Are What We Are that we talked about on uh, Cannibalistic Horror, I believe, hmm. when they came out. Uh, I I don't know if it was. I, I feel like I know Murph Murph was on that episode, but. Someone brought it up. I don't. I don't know if it was Murph or if it was uh, Katie. Yeah. From Necropolis, said that brought up that movie. So it is a standalone sequel because the only connect it it, it happens in the same universe because Tito the Corner 
is apparently in the movie. There's a That's, second movie with Mexican Wolverine? Yeah. Holy shit. Now, it's not a direct sequel. It's a standalone. It means yeah. it, Like, it's a standalone just means it's in the same universe. Yeah, but still. All right. The, the, the original story has nothing to do with this. Just the coroner guy. Yeah. Anyway, I thought it was a cool little tidbit. <laughs> so, now Dude Man's alive and out and about, but he's... It's almost like this thing turns you into a vampire. Yeah, yeah. Like, because he's, he's starting to... He, he's starting to rot. He's craving blood. He the Sunlight hurts him. He has to sleep in a fucking box. Like... I, I thought it was weird. cool though. He had to take a piece of like a, a like a shard of glass and cut open his mouth because yeah. it had already been sewn shut. Yeah. yeah. So that was kind of he's like, oh, let me take care of this first yeah. off. Like, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you can see his face. It's starting to rot, and it's yeah. Which mm-hmm. again, the effects I thought were really really tight with him. Yeah, it was. And then you know he he goes back home, and of course the granddaughter isn't scared of him. You know she helps him. Which again, classic Del Toro. Yeah. Where most adults will be like, "What the fuck are you?" The child, the the kid's like, eh, "Yeah, I accept you. Yeah, yeah you're, you're, you're walking zombie. You're dead. Whatever. Cool. But I'm cool. I'm cool, cool with you. Beans. You're cool to me when you're alive. Yeah. We're good. <laughs> so it's just a theme that runs through a lot of his movies. So well, when he shows up at the house, his wife is there, but she she he looks fucked up. Yeah. You know, and he realizes he has to go to confront the uncle. And he writes a letter. Is like, hey, I've got to go do this. Uh, I hope when I come back, you will love me no matter what I look like, right? And when he gets there with the uncle, uh, of course, Angel's waiting for yeah. him, right? They know he's alive. Well, and he's when he's he's going, and of course, the, the little girl is like, no, nah, man, we're a team. We're mm-hmm. Fucking backing your ass up. Oh, yeah, that's right. She, he told yeah. her to stay, and she's like, all of a sudden, like he's like she's like slowly trailing behind him. She makes a noise, and he turns around and he's like. What are you doing here? Yeah. Like, really, dude? Yeah. Yeah, you know she was going to show up. So, anyway, he ends up confronting the uncle and uh, come to find out, you know, the device gives you everlasting life. They had a previous conversation before all of this. Just he didn't really believe it, I guess. He yeah. He, he, like, he didn't, I think, realize the 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 depth of where it went, like, as far as the craving of blood, because... Like the uncle, uh, the uncle has been studying this shit, because there's pages of this book that explain everything. Well, yeah, it's a journal of the alchemist. Yeah, The, yeah, uncle, and, the and, uncle has a journal of the alchemist who created it. Yeah, and that's where he's just like, uh, yeah, you you know what? It would help if you had these these pages, because it explains exactly what you're supposed to do. He's like, you, you're still walking around with that, that the same flesh. He's like, you know, there's a whole other flesh that's, like, yeah, behind ba- under Yeah, because the dude's like, well, then explain the... Well, I'm rotting away, and he's like... Peel it off. Yeah. And you're like, what the fuck? Yeah. He's like, no. Peel it off. And you can see, like, starting of, like, a white, like, the moon. Yeah, when he peels it off, you see that moon white skin that we yeah. saw in The Alchemist at the beginning of the movie, who... Yep. He was, you could tell he had just been reborn, and he had all that blood because... Because the, the uncle says, you need blood. You need blood to f- help the skin grow and go back to looking normal. I wonder if there's anybody that can provide that blood for our main dude. Hmm. Oh. Uh, maybe, uh, there's, well... Maybe. How about the uncle? Well, <laughs> he he did attack the uncle, but he didn't actually kill him. Yeah, he stabs him, and then he does his kind of like, yeah, motherfucker, mm. I'm gonna fucking... Now you, you're, you fucked up. But he forgot about little girl, and she fucking... What does she pick up? N- nails him with something, but I can't remember what it was. Yeah, I can't like, remember what it was. But it was enough to she fucking... She fucked him up. Yeah. So he, he, he jumps down and just goes to town... And then he stops and he looks over and there's his granddaughter watching him like munch down on this dude. Yeah. Like, like so he stops himself and then wait, Angel shows up. Yeah, because there's a moment there where he like looks at her almost like, I kind of need your blood too. But he's, yeah, he stops himself. Like he, he, he gets humanized again. Yeah, and Angel so. shows up and uh, he's like so happy the uncle's dead, right? And then you hear the uncle like, Angel. And he's like, oh no. And he fucking. Finishes him off, he which is awesome. Quick, man. Yeah. He's like right to the fucking boot to the throat. That was yep. awesome. But the there's no way there was like no way out from there. So like the uh, the our dude man and his granddaughter were chilling and hiding. So they run out, and now it's just a race between Angel and those two. And they they run outside. They get up on a fucking billboard. They're like fighting, yada yada yada, uh, to save his grant to save his granddaughter who was. Managing to get away because he was deterring Angel. Yeah. During this chase, uh, he grabs Angel and jumps off the fucking marquee sign that they had worked their way up to. Oh yeah, and through and the through fucking... the fucking roof, which yeah. killed Angel. Yeah, through the sunroof. Yeah, yeah. There's a shards of glass everywhere. Yeah, yeah. killed Angel, and uh, 
That's right. I, I got mixed up because it's at, he comes. Angel's dead. Our dude gets up. She shows up, and you see a little bit of that bloodlust because he's all fucked up. He needs blood, and he looks at her for a second. She had gotten cut from yeah. touching something, and he looks at that, and you see him look at her blood, and he's like, and then you, and then like he, his, the humanity comes back, and you see like, oh fuck, no, if it'll make me kill the like. The per- like, I mean, he loves his wife, obviously, but if it'll make me kill my granddaughter, yeah, like this is not okay, and so he destroys it. Yep, he fucking crushes. Which, what the I love it is he's crushing. It. It's this, you know, gold, like a metal. Th- but after a while, you start seeing like ooze come out of it, like yeah. the inner innards of it. Yeah, so. like like I said, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of gears and everything. It shows the inter like the that's what another is effect the I like. It's every a couple of times when it's injecting him, it does it inside, it, and you see all the gears are spinning up. And almost like this, like heart inside the amulet that's running everything that provides. It's a heart, but if you look, it's got like a tail that wags, and yeah. it's got like legs that you can see yeah. kind of move. The closest you kind of get to that Del Toro, like it's something. Yeah. And, but it's not yeah. human. I don't know what it is. It's something. Yeah, it's something. But then you see the ooze. You're like, okay, that that makes sense. So we're destroying that because the uncle said if you destroy that, you kill yourself. Yeah. So after that, it's destroyed. They go home. Lay in bed, and basically the granddaughter, his wife, and him just are waiting for sun up to see if the effects are gone and if he's going to survive. Yeah. And that's a hard, hard ending because, like, you don't know what the fuck happened. And Dottoro is usually pretty solid at his endings. Like, I think one thing we got future to Tor- in, in future Del Toro was, like, like a pretty finite ending to things. You mean, like, Pan's Labyrinth, where it's like, oh, by the way, that little girl you really liked? You know, like, mm. that kind of shit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this was, like, a kind of a guessing game. Did he live? Yeah. Did he not? Yeah. Ah, did he kill them both? I you think know? this more is kind of supposed to be open-ended. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, you know, like, you know, the optimistic people are like, good, he survived. Things are good. You know, the motherfucker's like, oh, no, he's fucking dead, and they it sucks ass, and, like, so... Let, there's, there's, like, probably, uh, I don't know about you, but I don't know for me, it's like, Oh no, the effects were there, and he just like drank both their blood, and now yeah. he's just <laughs> yeah, they're yeah, they're dead, they're dead, motherfuckers. Yeah, he's yeah. alive, they're dead. <laughs> That's, but anyway, uh, this past the chopping block for me, it it, it was it was it's a good film. Uh, I will definitely rewatch it um, again. Another easy one for intro to horror people too. Yeah, it, it's it's a slow slow burn. It's very like it's, it's story driven. It's, it's yeah, it's it's very not to shock and awe. Like mm-hmm. it's it's just like you're following the story. And I think it's because of his main character, the main guy in it. You know, he's just he's pretty much like this almost grandfather, mm-hmm. you know, and he's like, he still has a responsibility to his wife and to his, you know, granddaughter. And, and so it kind of humanizes him, but he's changing. So, like, he never lets it get out of control. Like, exactly. Yeah. And we, how, we don't really see that that often in horror. Yeah. Like, we usually, what we, the, the, the common trope is we see that it takes them over. Yeah. At, eventually. Like, it does take over. It might take longer than others, but it ta- it does take over. This one, it never fully takes over. I thought it was really cool. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, it passed for me. It's, again, it's slower pace, but it's enjoyable. And mm-hmm. it's well done. It's shot beautifully. I mean, it's, you know. Oh, yeah, it is gorgeous. It, it, and it has that little mark. It's very early on, Del Toro. And, again, you don't have crazy fucking ass creatures or ghosts or something like that. But it has that small, just kind of personal mark on mm-hmm. it. So. Which, which, again... Leads to future kaiju movies and yep. other ho- other extreme horror fantasy movies and like Pan's Labyrinth is probably one of the darkest fucking. And that's that's kind of I could definitely you could tell it's just from the same director of Pan's Labyrinth. Like, even without Del, all the monsters, I wonder if Del Toro was a was a Clive Barker fan. Oh yeah, when I to see be. Pan's Labyrinth, I'm like, oh Nightbreed. <laughs> like oh, I'd say just because literally every the first couple shots of the amulet stabbing him, you get close up. And that thing digging into the skin. Oh yeah, and the like first Hellraiser, thing, yeah. And the first thing yeah. I thought about, honestly, is the fucking hooks in the skin and Hellraiser. Hellraiser. Yeah. So and that specific like close up. So mm. yeah, I think he was. The love stories that he tells within that, like Shape of Water, like love, like love stories with, with within a monster and a human. Yeah. It's it just there's so much there. Like I could totally see him being a huge fan of Clive Barker. I don't know. I'm just guessing from his work. <laughs> you know, Clive Barker was one of the first ones to do that kind of thing. Like, as hardcore as it was. Yeah. So, but anyway, totally passed, unanimous, passed, survive the chopping block, flying colors. Uh, hit us up, lowdownbrown.gygmail.com. Let us know what you think about this film. 
whether it's the first time you've seen it after you listen to this or you've already seen it and you just wanted our take on it, let us know what you think and uh, go to giraffepodcast.com. Check out all our links. We've got amazon.com. You click on that link. It'll take you to Amazon. You shop like normal. We get a fucking kickback and that's always badass. Uh, second one being T Public. Click on that link. You go to all our merch. It is our merch store. You can get We've got like, I think we're 43 designs now. It's yep. fucking ridiculous. T-shirts, some, banners, laptop bags. No like, koozies. No koozies. Um, <laughs> and some of the designs don't need to be there, Fuck, but like they're said, there. Just get, just get a bunch of fucking stickers, man. Yeah, What's just a little, bunch of fucking stickers. You got 40 seriously. designs. You can find some stickers. Exactly. <laughs> and they have two different sizes. Oh, magnets too now. Oh, So magnets shit. and stickers. Yeah. This easy things. Yeah. So definitely check that out. And while you're on GUIPodcast.com, check out all the shows under the network. We have something for everybody. Try them out. Give them a try. See if they're for you. And uh, until we talk to you again, stay safe. Hey guys, Scotty Big Daddy Preston here, that's right, the Geek Father, asking you to join me here every other week with friends and family of the GUI Network as we go through all the trials and tribulations of being a geeky parent. So remember, join us or cry. My name is Amy Bogard. And I'm Mike the Hobbit. And we are the hosts of Deeply Upsetting, where we use our expertise to answer your most upsetting hypothetical quandaries, such as what non wigged animal deserves wings? And what body part deserves a secret mouth? Which cryptid is the worst roommate? These questions and more that plague you will be answered on Deeply Upsetting, available anywhere you get your podcasts and at GUIPodcast.com. In a world ravaged by movie studios that keep rehashing the same things, only one podcaster has the guts to make it even worse. Join Mike the Hobbit as he traverses the internet to bring you some of the best and worst ideas for reboots, remakes, and reimaginings of some of your favorite and least favorite TV and film properties. Ideas like a John Waters He-Man movie, Fantastic Four the Musical, and Aliens, done entirely with marionettes. What podcast would bring this evil upon the world? This is Smack My Pitch Up. Available anywhere you get your podcasts.